In the last video, we defined this idea of circular motion and how can you calculate how fast something is moving around a circle. And remember, how fast can mean a couple different things. It can mean how fast as far as a linear velocity in meters per second, or how fast in terms of an angular velocity. How many times around the circle are you going every second? In this video, we're going to take the next step and then use that velocity, angular and linear velocity, to calculate a centripetal force and a centripetal acceleration. So the acceleration and force that is causing the circular motion in the first place. Now, to do this, again, I'm gonna start by reminding you Newton's first law states that an object is gonna keep moving in a straight line unless there's a force that is changing that motion. And acceleration uh, can be changing direction because acceleration is just changing velocity and direction is part of that velocity. So let's figure out the acceleration uh, that an object is experienced when it travels in, that is an object is experiencing when it's traveling in a circle. And then what is the force that creates that acceleration? F equals MA, if there's acceleration, there must also be some sort of force. So centripetal acceleration is the acceleration representing the rate of change of velocity and specifically its direction. Um, so if there is a car traveling around a curve, even if the speedometer says 60 miles per hour or 30 miles per hour the entire time without wavering, it is still accelerating. It's just not getting faster or slowing. slower, it is changing its direction. So that acceleration is gonna to point towards the center of the circle. We'll prove that in a little bit. And that acceleration can be calculated based on the linear velocity um, squared divided by the radius. We're not going to derive this for, for sake of time and just the complexity of that derivation. Um, you will be given this equation. So if you know the linear velocity, square it and divide it by the radius of the circle. So let's think of this uh, carousel example again. Again, this is a picture of a carousel from the top down. Um, centripetal acceleration can be found if you're looking at the change between the velocity vectors. So this horse here, um, has a velocity, let's call it u, its initial velocity. Uh, as it travels a little bit farther, that linear velocity is gonna change its direction. Um, so if this horse then takes the place of this horse, because it is rotated a little bit, um, we know that that velocity is now pointed in a different place. Um, the change in direction is going to give us our acceleration. So. I'm going to try to visualize for you how we can see that change in direction. This uh, vector u is going to change into the vector v by changing its direction. So now it's the same as the vector v. The amount that it changed here, um, this change, is our acceleration. That's our centripetal acceleration. And right in between this u and v, we would place that average acceleration shows up right there. And it's pointing towards the center. If I did the same animation for two horses in a different spot, we would see that A always is going to point us towards the center of the circle. Um, so that is very important. Another way that you're going to be able to know that acceleration is towards the center is the acceleration is always going to go in the direction of the net force. And we will see uh, later on that this force is always going to be drawing us towards the center. So if we have this equation then to calculate centripetal acceleration, uh, we can define actually some other equations as well. In your data booklet, uh, you'll see several different equations in the circular motion um, part of the, the equations. And uh, this video is in many ways just showing you where they come from because um, some of these equations look a little crazy. So this is the first centripetal acceleration equation that I'm showing you but this can be used to find the second. Um, we know that the linear velocity from the equation in the last video is just the angular velocity times the radius. And the angular velocity, you remember, is two pi divided by t. So if I substitute in that angular velocity, I get this velocity is two pi r divided by t. If I wanted to calculate linear velocity, this is probably how I would do it. Take the, um, circumference of the circle divided by the time it takes to go the full circumference. That's the velocity. Now, if I plug in this in terms of that velocity and the velocity squared, we're going to get some pretty crazy stuff going on. So I'm going to plug that in 
So instead of v, I'm going to just use 2 pi r over t. Um, that is squared. And so I'm going to need to distribute that square to all of the parts. So 2 squared is 4, and pi squared, r squared, and t squared. Um, so that simplifies down to this, which doesn't look simpler, um, but it will in a little bit. So now we have 4 pi squared r squared over t squared over r. Um, I'm just going to send that t squared down to the bottom. It's the same thing. I'll just divide it once instead of dividing twice here. So that then gives me 4 pi squared r squared over t squared r. Um, we've got r, a term of r on both sides. Um, that r on the bottom cancels out and this squared part cancels out because now we're only left with one r on top. And that leaves us with this equation here. Um, you will not need to do this derivation. You are given this equation, and I'll show it to you in the next slide. Um, I just wanted to show you where it comes from because this is the first time I've ever seen an equation that uses a squared on pi. Uh, to square pi is not something that you see very often. Um, so I wanted to show you where it comes from, that it isn't a typo. Uh, it comes from this derivation. So in your data booklet, you'll notice that this is actually in subtopic six. Um, so far, we've been focusing all on subtopic two, on topic two. Uh, we are taking a brief detour here to topic six because circular motion is super interconnected with motion and forces, and it makes more sense to do it here. Um, these acceleration equations are found here. Uh, A is equal to V squared over R, or A is equal to four pi squared R over t squared. You do not need to use this whole thing. You can just use a is equal to v squared over r or a is equal to a or 4 pi squared r over t squared. So let's go back to our carousel one more time. Um, in the last video, we used this example to calculate an angular velocity and a linear velocity. And you remember the big takeaway there was that the angular velocity stayed the same. They were both uh, fixed on the same circular path. Um, They're moving together the entire time on a turntable, which meant that their period was the same. And since there's no radius, it doesn't matter which row you're in. If there's no radius in the angular velocity equation. We got the same angular velocity, but the linear velocity was different. Um, the farther you were away, the higher the linear velocity was. So now let's look at acceleration. Which one is going to provide a larger centripetal acceleration towards the center of the circle? Now, acceleration, one of the equations that we saw in the last slide was V squared over R. So V is 1.3 squared divided by 2 for row A here. We can get an acceleration of 0.843 meters per second squared. So even though this acceleration is not linear, it's the acceleration towards the center of a circle. We call it centripetal acceleration we still have the same units. It's still in meters per second squared. So with that in mind, um, row B is really only different in the fact that it's farther away uh, from the center of the circle. I'd like you to calculate the centripetal acceleration for a horse on row B. So unlike the angular velocity, centripetal acceleration does change as well because it is, in this equation, based on the linear velocity and the linear velocity changed. So I get 1.9 squared over three. That's about 1.2 meters per second squared. So you probably haven't heard as much about centripetal acceleration, but you probably have heard the term centripetal force at some point. So if uh, Newton's second law is to be believed, uh, F equals MA, if there's acceleration ever, there has to be some net force causing this change in velocity. It's not going to change on its own. An object's going to keep moving in a straight line if there is no external force. So that means we can find this centripetal force, this force causing the circular motion. If we combine these equations, F equals MA, but A, we now know for circular motion, is V squared over R. So that gives us an equation, F is equal to MV squared over R. This is going to be the most important equation of this entire unit. Um, this is the equation that tells us specifically the force that is required to make something move in a circle.
Of course, in our data booklet, it's not the only equation for centripetal force that's provided. Uh, there's another equation that's derived by combining these two. If V is just omega times R, if I plug that in here for V um, and then distribute in that two, I end up with F is equal to M omega squared R. Um, here, our R squared over R just simplifies down to a single radius. Um, so that's where this is coming from. So you don't need to have the linear velocity. If you had the angular velocity, that is okay too, um, because both of these are provided in your data booklet. F is equal to mv squared over r, or F is equal to m omega squared times r. Now this, uh, these equations for F are very much related to the equations for A. Uh, if you know F equals ma, really, especially this first one, is exactly the same thing. M is or mv squared over r versus v squared over r. The only difference is you're multiplying by mass. Um, so if you know the acceleration, you could just use f equals ma instead of going back to a larger equation. Either is fine. So to see an example of that, say I ask you about this rock. Um, so I, I have a rock that's swinging a circle of radius five. If its constant speed is eight meters per second, what is its centripetal acceleration and force? So the things I know, I know that the mass is three kilograms. I know that the radius is five meters. And then in this eight meters per second, that is V and not omega. I know it's V because linear velocity is measured in meters per second, but angular velocity omega is radians per second. So V in this case is eight meters per second. Now, if I want to find this centripetal acceleration, I'm going to use the equation here that matches what I have. Um, I could use the other one, but it's a little harder because I have to figure things out first. Because um, I don't know T, I'm not given that, but I am given V and R. So I'm going to use this first equation, A is equal to V squared over R. 8 squared over 5 is 12.8 meters per second squared. Then if I wanted to find the force, I could, because I have everything I need, for this first equation, just plug those in and find force there. Or if I want, I can just use F equals MA because I know the acceleration is 12.8. The mass is three, three times 12.8 is 38.4. For the record, if I did uh, MV squared over R, three times eight squared divided by five is also 38.4. So there's another way that you can find it there. With all that in mind, I'd like you to try this last one. Uh, a pilot is flying in a small plane uh, at a speed of 30 meters per second with a radius of 100 meters. What is the force, uh, or if a force of 635 newtons is needed to maintain the pilot's circular motion, that's a centripetal force, what is the pilot's mass? So figure out what you have, figure out which of these equations will be useful, uh, I'd like you to solve for the mass. What I know in this problem is V, the uh, linear velocity, because it's in meters per second, is 30 meters per second. Radius is 100. The force is 635. I'm looking for the mass. Uh, the equation that's going to help me here is this first one. The second one is nice if I have angular velocity in radians per second, but I don't in this case. Uh, so I'm going to use the first one, plugging in what I know. 635 is equal to mass times 30 squared divided by 100. Solving for the mass, I get that that pilot is about 70.56 kilograms. Uh, in our next video, our next lesson, we're going to talk about some more intricate scenarios where you might be going in a vertical circle or dealing with friction, that sort of thing. But for right now, um, using these simple equations is all I'm looking for. As a summary of what we've talked about and learned uh, in these first couple of videos, the velocity can be measured in two different ways. Linear velocity, V, is measured in meters per second. Angular velocity, omega, that curly W, is radians per second. It is important to know the difference because you will often be provided with one or the other or being asked to solve for one or the other, and knowing the difference is essential. Centripetal acceleration is always um, something that's changing direction towards the center. Uh, and centripetal acceleration, sometimes I'll describe that with a subscript C um, just to help define it. But it's still going to be in meters per second squared. 
that acceleration is shown here in subtopic 6.1. And then centripetal force is always directed toward the center as well. And um, if you know F equals MA, you can find these derived equations because um, they're all essentially the same. So in this video, uh, you should be able to determine the direction and magnitude of centripetal acceleration, centripetal force, always pointing towards the center, and then use the calculations accordingly. And then identify the circular motion properties in a description and choose the appropriate equation accordingly. Um, so know what you are given so that you know how to relate them using one of those equations in the data booklet.